Game of Thrones Season 3, Episode 10. Misa. 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 Am I supposed to say anything? <laughs> no, you're supposed to just smile and look around <laughs> I don't while know I what hold you're, you up. You're trying to. <laughs> just doing the Misa thing. Yeah, no, and I get that. You know, at the end. I was thinking of trying to do like a Jar Jar Binks thing, but nothing came to my head, so I just, I just kept quiet. Wow, you should have done that. That would have been the perfect opportunity. I know. You want to start that again? Nah, it's already passed. Okay. Just start the episode. I always talk about that I like the calm after the storm when big events like this happen, but the beginning of this episode, there's still some more chaos to be had. And this first shot of Roose Bolton walking up on the twins, overlooking what he had done. And if this was another, if this was like a Hollywood movie, it would have panned into his face and he would have been like, God, what have I done? <laughs> and then you see all the chaos. But just after the aftermath of the Red Wedding, it's, it's still that gut punch when you watch these scenes. Yeah, it's this stuff scene is so great, but in all the wrong reasons, obviously as a fan, but everything from just the Stark flag burning and just seeing yeah. all those men just get annihilated. And that's the thing too. We talk about how the main characters died, but they obliterated the Stark army. Yeah. And especially Arya having to see that and oh. course, she awakes right at the time when they trot out Rob's body with Grey Wind's head attached to it. I think this is top five most disturbing thing I've ever seen on the show. Mostly because it's it's the character that Rob, he was a character so full of life and you were, we were all rooting for him. And just to see him headless with Grey Wind's head attached to his body, sewn onto his body, it's such a disturbing image. And even the Hound is disgusted by it. I know, yeah. I don't think he's ever seen something so grotesque. No. It's real, real brutal way. And the disrespect, too. I mean, you could just say, oh, they did it because they wanted to win the war. And that's war. Yes. But just to completely mutilate his body and his wolf's body like that and basically disrespect and spit on his grave and spit on everything the Stark name represents is just... What anything. are they chanting? Here comes the king of the north. King of the north. The king, king of the, of the north. Yeah, yeah. King of the north. Oh, yeah. It's really messed up. Just rubbing it in. What do you think about that theory, too, that because when Rob dies in the books, the last thing he thinks of is Grey Wind. It's like John. John thinks of Ghost, that he warged into Grey Wind and got a couple licks in before he died. Obviously, in the show, it couldn't happen. I like that. I think I've seen a video like that. I didn't watch it, but I think it was in one of the recommendations. Like I think it was Ultra Dex. Yes. It's like, did Rob die twice right, or something right. like that? And I've read a few theories online about that. I would like to think he got a couple couple licks in. Well, because they stress that in the book, too, where Walter Frey says, you can't bring your dire wolf into the hall yeah. because everybody's just going to be scared. And Rob's like, okay. But really, they just didn't want to deal with this giant fucking beast Yeah. after Rob gets stabbed. I wish they would have let him out in the show. Yeah, that would have been cool. And I talked about this, too, a couple of episodes ago, that Tyrion and Sansa, they do start to bond over the course of their short-lived marriage. And this scene where they're being laughed at by two people who walk by, and Tyrion tells Sansa that, listen, I've been laughed at a lot longer than you have. And they're just kind of trading stories about how they're both outcasts in this situation. Yeah, it's a nice moment to talk about how to get back at him, and Sansa suggests filling their uh, mattresses with uh, was it sheep. Yeah. Sheep dung. Yeah. And how Arya used to do that to her. It's a nice moment. It kind of gets a little more into that relationship of Arya and Sansa, which we haven't really seen or heard about in so long. Yeah. And it kind of connects her back to her Stark roots and her Stark family, which when we see that shot later on for crying, it kind of makes that more impactful. Like, oh, yeah, she is a Stark. She's spent her whole life with these people and her family. So it's a nice little moment for them when they're laughing about it and her rem reminiscing on those days. And did you notice when Pod comes to tell Tyrion he's needed at the small council uh, meeting? The two noble women are like, oh, my God, it's Pod. No. <laughs> yeah. I, he's got a rep now. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, word spread, spreads quick. Yeah, it does. Well, this small council meeting, too, is one of the best dramatic scenes. Just the dialogue in this scene is flawless. The way that all these characters are going back and forth, every line said by a character in this scene is perfect. And when Joffrey gives Tyrion the news, when he reads the, the note written by Walder Frey, and he's like, what is this, bad poetry? And the way that Jack Leeson delivers these lines, he is such a good actor because this character is such a little fucking shit. Yeah. He is such a little bastard, and he's just so good. When he says, Rob Stark is dead, 
You can't yeah. believe it. And his bitch mother, too. His, <laughs> like, like an afterthought. Like, yeah. Yeah, he is the fucking worst. And I love this scene, too, because Joffrey, immediately his mind goes to, yeah, send Walder Frey a letter and tell him to send Rob Stark's head. I'm going to serve it to Sansa at my wedding feast. And Tyrion kind of stands up to Joffrey. It's asserting that Sansa is not his to torment anymore. And that the way he delivers that line, too, it's one of the best lines. They used it in the season six teaser when they had all the characters on the wall of faces. And you hear Joffrey say, everyone is mine to torment. Everyone is mine to torment. You do well to remember that, you little monster. But when Tyrion goes back with him and he talks about speak to me more softly if I'm a monster because now kings are dying like flies. And there's even that shot of Varys where he kind of snickers. Um, But the best part of this scene is when Joffrey goes at Tywin. And this is the second time in the season where they've had a scene together where they confront each other. And to me, I mean, just just play the clip. It's, (laughs) it's It's incredible. My father won the real war. He killed Prince Rhaegar. He took the crown while you hid on a costly rock. Yeah, everyone knows Joffrey fucked up. Even Joffrey, he's kind of like, ooh, <laughs> did I say that? <laughs> but he makes, a, he makes a fair point, too, because Tywin, that was his strategy during Robert's Rebellion. I'm going to wait and see who's going to win, and then I'll side with them. <laughs> And once again, it shows the love that Joffrey did have for Robert. He truly did worship Robert Baratheon. And we go back to the theories, was he the one who sent the assassin to kill Bran to somehow impress his dad in some type of fucked up way? I don't think he loved him. I think he he admired him. He's trying to find that emptiness inside him by trying to look up to someone and trying to receive love back. But Well, I think he likes to fashion himself the new Robert, but he's obviously a coward. Yeah. I think even Marjorie mentions it to him, that you defended the city so valiantly. It's so funny that Tywin just sends him to bed. Uh, I'm not tired. (laughs) That back and forth again where we talk about who holds the power in Westeros when Tyrion says, you just sent the most powerful man in Westeros to bed without his supper. Tywin says, you really think he's the most powerful man in Westeros? Tywin's like the Warren Buffett. You know, he's pulling the strings on the politicians. (laughs) You're a fool if you believe he's the most powerful man in Westeros. A treasonous statement. Joffrey is king. You really think a crown gives you power? No. Yeah, these scenes between Tywin and Tyrion are so great, too. Every time we get a scene, it's just so impactful, and you just have so much sympathy for Tyrion, and you wonder why he just continues to do this. It's obvious no one in his family loves him besides Jaime, and especially after Sansa receives the news, he really has nothing besides Shay and Jaime. Yeah, and the philosophical discussion that they have about what's more honorable, to kill men in battle, or a couple men at dinner. But to me, it's it's once again one of the best lines of the series when Tyrion says, the North will remember this, and Tywin says, good. The Northerners will never forget. Good. Let them remember what happens when they march on the South. He's just such a Machiavellian mastermind. He, he's willing to do anything to protect his legacy. And to me, that's always so fascinating because he always talks about how soon I'm going to be dead, you're going to be dead, your kids are going to be dead. It's the legacy that lives on. He's trying to immortalize his family by winning this war, and he knows it's the most important thing. And in a way, I can kind of understand why he's willing to do these things. Well, Tyrion calls him out as his actions being selfish. That it's not really helping the greater family, it's just helping you. And I don't know if I necessarily agree with that. Tywin has a different reason for disagreeing, because he let Tyrion live instead of throwing him into the ocean. I think it's not necessarily that Tywin's selfish, because he's not getting much out of it. I mean, Tywin's life has been work, 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 running the kingdom, being the hand, saving his family by crushing uh, House Rain. So... What is he really getting out of this besides preserving the Lannister name? Yeah, true. I mean, he just has a different way of going about it. He's not going to be warm and fuzzy with his children. He's all business all the time. And he has, it's kind of that, it kind of mirrors what's going on with Davos and Stannis, where they have the argument, what's one bastard boy to a whole kingdom? What's 12 people at dinner compared to thousands of men? Yeah, Tywin won't hesitate to make that move. Yeah, that's what I always love about the show is that they present us these dilemmas and they don't really take a side. They let you decide for yourself. But you talked about it before, that scene when Tyrion goes to visit Sansa and all he says is he just says her name and she looks back and she is just a mess. Yeah. It's one of those scenes, once again, where you could just feel that sadness. It's really radiating off of her in this moment and Tyrion just walks away. Yeah, it's not like she's hysterical. Like She's been through so much. The only thing she can do 
even though she's visibly distraught and crying, but it's more of just the calmness when she's looking outside the window, kind of just reminiscing and just realizing wh- where she is now and wh- who she's surrounded by. It's funny too, it's, it's similar to the look that Catelyn had. It's the final look where Catelyn's overlooking Rob's dead body and she slits the Frey girl's throat. It's just that emptiness that I'm dead on the inside now, that I have nothing left. Mm-hmm. Because to Sansa, like Catelyn, all of her family's gone. And we talked about this, too, in the previous review, the Night Fort. It was the first mention of the Night Fort. Now we're actually seeing the castle. And we talked about how, in the book, there's theories that this castle holds a dark secret for the Night's Watch. And the Night's King, the infamous Night's King, who took a White Walker bride, this is he made the Night Fort his seat. And he ruled and he made human sacrifices to the White Walkers. Um, well, that's a theory. But now we're actually seeing the castle. And Bran tells the story about the Rat Cook. Yeah, and obviously we were talking last week about guest right and how it's such an egregious law against the gods that if you kill someone under the protection of your own home after you offered them shelter and food, that the gods don't take that too kindly. I mean, they turn this guy into a a giant rat. It's an interesting point. Like, this whole story was telling, like, the gods didn't do this because he killed the king or uh, he killed the king's son or fed it to him. It's that he violated this guest right. And that's obviously very prominent for just what happened last week when Walder Frey took that to the, notch that up a little bit. Yeah, I'll violate the guest right, but I'll do, I'll go, I'll do it with the bang. If you're going to violate the guest right, you might as well just go all in. <laughs> and that cut, too, where we see Walder Frey eating the pie, and it foreshadows what's going to happen to him in season six. And this makes me think, too, that they told the story in the show that this might happen in the books, where Arya does cook Walder Frey's sons. No, it's more manually. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's true. But it is it is a nice piece of foreshadowing here. This is what I call the calm after the storm, this conversation between Walder Frey and Roose Bolton. And we didn't really hit on it a lot last episode, but just the evilness and the wickedness in these two men to be willing to do something like this. It's one thing for Tywin to plan it, but it's another thing to be there and execute it. To actually stab somebody in the heart. To betray your king. And Walder Frey, I mean, they do a great job of making the phrase this kind of kind of disgusting looking family where you feel dirty when they're on screen like the mcpoils of westeros yeah they really are um they're the black sheep and it's funny too how the way they position them in the middle of the kingdom where they're not really northerners but they're not really part of the riverlands either they're just kind of outsiders yeah i mean but if you're going to get two people to pull this off you want to take someone who really has no regard to anyone besides themselves and ruse or someone who's been slighted numerous times by the people they are trying to destroy in Walder Frey and he goes he lists all the times he's been slighted how they call him late Walder Frey and how he's always been looked upon as not important or not to the level of a Tully or a Stark and after what is it like 80 something years of that there's a breaking point I guess and (laughs) Tywin I guess is able to pick that out and realize that and use it to his advantage. Tywin and Tyrion discussed that as well that Walder Frey would not have done this on his own unless he had certain assurances. And we learn that Roose Bolton is going to be the Warden of the North, and they're just kind of discussing their spoils of war. They mention that the Blackfish has escaped, but Walder Frey isn't really concerned about that. He has Tywin Lannister backing him. But Roose Bolton talks about how he's going to rebuild Winterfell and possibly move in. And another great transition where Walder Frey questions him, what happened at Winterfell when Theon Greyjoy took it over? And he says that he sent his bastard Ramsay to clean up the mess and well this is a story all about how my bastard turned winterfell upside down upside down <laughs> sideways it's oh, just a great transition yeah it is great to ramsey and theon <laughs> the ironborn turned on theon as we knew they would they handed him over trussed and hooded but ramsey well ramsey has his own way of doing things Oh, those weren't lying. You had a good sized cock. Who, who's the on China kid? He, sees, he really thinks that sausage. He's not packing like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Come on. It's like, is that mine? <laughs> That's what Ramsey should have said. No, it's not yours. <laughs> it's funny. I watched the commentary for this too, and um, you and the actor who plays you and Rion, I think his name is, he said that he ate like ten sausages <laughs> while doing this scene, and you could see like the bites get smaller and smaller as the scene goes on. That he was just so disgusted. But that one image that always sticks in my head is when he picks it up and he kind of wiggles it. Yeah. And it's just, ugh. They talk about the phantom boner. 
It's a new Metal Gear Solid game, The Phantom Boner, starring Theon Greyjoy. Uh, yeah, and Ramsey gives him the iconic nickname of Reek. Yeah. At first I thought, when I first saw this, oh, Theon's going to just go out. He's going to die. Oh. And he was begging for it, too. He's like, yeah. kill me. So you're no use to us, Dad. You're Theon Greyjoy. He Actually, resists no, you're not. He resisted a little. Yeah, after... two punches. <laughs> I would have just let him kill me. That last one looked like it hurt when his neck goes all the way back. I was like, oof. Yeah, got some CT right there. Yeah, he's gonna have some concussion problems. It is such a great way that they give him the nickname too. It makes me think of (laughs) how bad it was in the Solo movie when Solo gets his name. I like to think that well, because in the books, Ramsey obviously had other reeks. Yes. So I kind of say in the show, maybe he did, and he was just trying to put a whole like show around it just to fuck with Theon. Well, the way he, I mean, he's so great as this character too, yeah. and it must be a delight to play him. He looks like he's having a great time, which worries me. But it feels very spontaneous that he came up with the name in the moment. He's just, he's sniffing him, and Theon, he looks dirty. He looks like he does smell like crap. I mean, everybody in this world probably smells like crap. Nobody takes a bath, except Melisandre. She didn't have the necklace on. That's a continuity problem. But, yeah, no. Actually, there's a way to get around that continuity yeah. problem. <laughs> if you want me to go on, like, a 10-minute diatribe. No, 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 that's fine. <laughs> I can. But you talk about the other reeks, too, and we discussed this, I think it was earlier in the season, that are you happy that they included these scenes? And I would say yes, because they're some of the most disturbing scenes in the show. And that transformation, because Theon's had one of the best arcs, I'm glad that they kept this transformation in the show. Does it take away from some of the mystery, you think? I don't think so. Because when we first see Reek in the show, in the book, he's already Reek. So it's kind of like, what happened to this man? When I did read it in the book, even though I knew it was Theon, it still felt mysterious. Yeah. Who is this person? It's not Theon. I think you could go about it each way. Yeah. And I think it was important because they wanted to establish Ramsay as the next Joffrey, because he's going to die earlier in season four, so. What? <laughs> Spoiler. <laughs> and it's always great when this story, this sprawling story, when some of the narratives intertwine. And here we see Bran meeting Sam and Gilly. Yeah, it's a great scene. But I mean, what if Summer just fucking unleashed on him? <laughs> He's kind of waiting in the background. You'd think he'd be right in the forefront. Like, let's I go. Come up here. <laughs> Come here, fat boy. <laughs> I do wonder how smart the Darbles are. Where it's like, I don't know. I feel like I can trust this guy. That he's good with direwolves. Yeah, I always liken it to uh, they take the mindset of either Rob, John, Bran, or Rickon. Right. That's why Shaggy Dogs, Shaggy Dog would have fucking tore him up. Oh, yeah. Rickon <laughs> would have been like, come here, boy. Let me at him. Let me at him. But it goes back to the Night 4, too, where Sam was talking about in the previous episode that there's a way to open the door that leads through the wall to get into the Night 4. And the book, it's, it's much more magical. Yeah. It's like you say words to a werewood tree, and he kind of like winks at you. It's like, <laughs> hey, how you doing? Getting into Bran's purpose of going north of the wall, that he's possibly the only person that can save the country at this point. And it's interesting to see you watching this again. My immediate thoughts like, what's Bran going to do in yeah. season eight to take down the White Walkers? But Has he done anything? He's, yeah. Uh, he's seen some things. <laughs> if his role in stopping the White Walkers was kind of just to tell John, yeah. <laughs> that's stupid because that really doesn't do much except for solidify John as maybe a king or. Right. But he's already hanging in the north, and you have Daenerys, so I don't think that's needed. Yeah, I guess in a way it's more people are willing to follow him, but there right, has you have to, Daenerys. There has to be something else. So we'll wait right, for Right, more that. information on how the First Men defeated them. Mm-hmm. And if it's that they had Dragonglass, then Samuel Tarly already took care of that in Season 2. Yeah, they probably need a little more. He's got to have a, more of a purpose mm-hmm. than what we've already seen. Now, these are characters that I totally always forget about until they pop back up. <laughs> Balon Greyjoy and Yara, who I always want to call Asha. I just can't stop myself from calling her Asha. This is one of the funniest letters, because he's written two of them, so I guess it's... <laughs> this one he wrote. Th- yeah, right. R- R- well, in the show. Wrote. In yeah. the show, he wrote both of them. Eh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's so great, man. In the box, you'll find Theon's favorite toy. He cried when I took it away from him. It would have been so funny if he opened it and it was Justin Timberlake, like, dick in a box, dick in a box. Or it was like a... What did they play with back in the day? Stick and hoop? Stick and hoop? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's like a medieval toy. I have no idea. I'm not a big medieval toy guy. I got that from like Patton Oswalt in that Park Show episode. <laughs> when he's like twirling the hoop yeah. with the stick. Yeah. Yeah. Like you said, you're like, oh, wait, the Greyjoys. I forgot about them. Do you like them? Not really. Do you like any of their storylines in the book or the show? 
not, uh, the book more and more. Yara obviously gets more of a role later on, but yeah, these are kind of just thrown in. Like, oh yeah, I, f- I remember these guys. Yeah, it's, it's like a king, I guess. Oh, okay. right. Okay. He attacked the North. He has strongholds. He's been successful. We haven't seen any of this. Yeah, he obviously never really had love for Theon, and this just even says he's not a man anymore. But Yara has different intentions as she gets 50 of the greatest killers on the Iron Islands, and she's going to the Dreadfort to take back her baby brother. It's funny, too, because I was like, does this happen in this episode, or is it the first episode of season four? When they get to the Dreadfort? Right. I had no idea. I was like, this happens in this episode? That's a great scene when Ramsay's shirtless. And he comes with the knives, and he's just like, yeah, let's scrap. <laughs> that is a great scene. But the I, Iron Islanders... Uh, I always like the voiceover montages in Game of Thrones. Even if it's something as insignificant as the Iron Islands, I'm kind of like, okay, I can get behind this. It would be a nitpick, but I, I just don't like this scene. There's a lot of scenes with Yara that I don't like. But even the voiceover here, it feels a little cheesy. Yeah. Like, was she giving this she, speech to Balon? Well, no, does she deserve voiceover status? <laughs> <laughs> but I just imagine Balon just like watching her and then like slapping her at the end of the speech. Like, get, get the fuck out of here. Do what you want, I don't care. Yeah. And finally, we see Bran, Jojen, Mira, and Hodor going north of the wall. And this is great too when Samwell gives, him, gives them the dragon glass. You could tell that Bran, it's destiny. It's something that he has to do, but he doesn't necessarily want to do. We were talking about how the dragon glass is so important. He sacrifices a dagger to Hodor, a uh, couple of arrows to... Mira. The Archer. What, what do you think? I know, like, the last scene, they were talking about how they were trying to convince Sam that they need to take him beyond the wall, but come on, Sam. How gullible are you? Just a bunch of kids. Your best friend's fucking crippled brother so wants to go where you just saw a white walk. I think Jojen kind of freaked him out. Yeah, he probably like, How does he know that I saw all these things? What other choice does Sam will have? I mean, if they say no, then... Oh, another thing. Didn't they, like, deduce that the wall was going to be under attack or Castle Black? Yes. They're like, hey, Sam, by the way, <laughs> so it's a wild, like, yeah, it could have happened off screen. Yeah, yeah. But I just thought it was interesting, screen. like, hey, maybe, because I feel like they don't know until John tells him. Yes. Or maybe Sam does say something. I don't them know. going north of the wall, too, there's always a great sense of wonder with this arc. And it's, it's one that I really enjoyed for the first four seasons. It's one that I think I enjoyed even in season six. I think season seven, we had some mixed feelings about the way that they presented Bran. But there is always that great sense of wonder. And fantasy exploration and journey and destiny involved with Bran's journey. But this is a great scene, too, between characters Davos and Gendry, kind of re- reminiscing on their past, their similar upbringings. Because at first, Gendry thinks that Davos is highborn. And he says, boy, do I have a fucking story to tell you. No, yeah, it is nice, because we see how skeptical Gendry is of highborn and how every time he trusts one of them, it gets, gets betrayed. Lord Beric betrayed him, uh, Melisandre, Stannis, and now Davos comes down. So it's nice for them to connect over that King's Landing and their upbringing. It kind of builds that relationship where even though Stannis probably doesn't know him that well, he knows where he's been and how what kind of person he is which makes even more of a reason for him to save him later on because i think davos is a, a good guy so he would have tried to do it anyway but i think that relationship and just that one scene was able to solidify davos's actions yeah and he definitely sees himself in gandry he sees his son and he talks about how he never necessarily wanted to become a highborn lord or to become a lord but that he did it for his son so that his son wouldn't wake up to a, a river of shit outside of his front door every morning and then gandry says does he have a better life? And when Davos delivers that final line, he's dead. How'd he die? Following me. And it's funny how in this world, it's a cruel world, that you can do everything in your power to give your son a better life. But circumstances made it that Mathis would have to sacrifice his life to the man that was trying to make it better. For the man that was trying to make it better in Stannis. So it's it's that bitter irony of life in Westeros. And life in general, too. Where you just never know what's going to be thrown at you. And another scene, too, with characters kind of talking about their similar upbringings. And the circumstances that they now find themselves in. Varys and Shay. Varys is trying to convince her, hey, you, you need to leave. Because <laughs> you're an impediment on Tyrion's well-being in the capital. 
Thanksgiving. Get the fuck out of here already. No one likes you. <laughs> yeah, he tries her to give her diamonds, which is enough to get a big house, servants, and all this, a life that she would otherwise never have dreamed of having before she met Tyrion. That's why I say this is true love, that she does love him. If it was about the money, then she would have taken the diamonds. Yeah, but he's probably like, I can get, I can get the bag every other week if I'm with Tyrion. I, I, but yeah, he believes her to be a complication for Tyrion. He truly believes that Tyrion is the only one that can do some good in Westeros, and her presence in the capital can inhibit that from happening. Yeah, we can already see it too when Tyrion and Sansa are walking and he looks back at Shay. It's, this can't go on anymore. And Shay has the line where she says, if he wants me to leave, then he can tell me himself. And it's similar to what Tyrion makes Daenerys do in season six with Dario, saying that this guy is going to be a liability in the Seven Kingdoms. You're going to need to make matches, possibly get married again. You can't have a lover boy running around. And at this point, Shay is the lover girl. But it's, once again, it's, it's the end of their relationship is coming. But at least Dario can get a hint. It's like, yeah, I can see that. I'm not happy about it, but I'll make do. And Varys does say to Shay, this will never be your home. And he's right. <laughs> she dies. Oh, poor Podrick in this episode. He's getting pushed around, doing everybody's dirty work. I love that. She just walks in and leave. <laughs> <laughs> Tyrion's trying to get him wasted. You so think you Cersei heard up. the news about Pod? It's like, ah. Leave, but stay outside. Yeah. I got to speak to you about something. Are we things. related? <laughs> God damn it. She goes back. She gets the books that Ed got, Ned got from. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> from Grand Maester Faisal. And goes back and pods history. It's, it's like, the yeah. same clues. <laughs> Meets him in the garden. Great line by Tyrion, too, that being drunk all the time isn't easy. If it was, then everybody would do it. <laughs> Another surprising scene, I always forget about this scene, too, between Tyrion and Cersei. It's very, it's not very hostile. No. it's. A, I think these are always the best scenes, where they're yeah. kind of just hanging out, just talking. Where you can feel like, oh, they... They're brother and sister. Maybe mm-hmm. they do love each other. I like to pretend that all the stuff between them never happened in this scene, that they're buddies. Yeah. <laughs> they have great chemistry with each other, too. And Cersei's advice to Tyrion is to give Sansa a child, something that she can love. And she says that's the only thing that she loves in her life is her children. She said it's the only thing that kept her from killing herself. Throw, yeah, throwing herself at the highest window in the re- of the Red Keep, which is very ironic, since your son, the only thing he did love, keeping you from jumping out the highest window of the Red Keep, jumped out the highest yeah, window. Yeah, yeah, look at that. <laughs> uh, I didn't even think about that, yeah. Yep. How fucked up is it, too, where you're in a position where the only thing that can keep you happy is having a child from somebody that you hate? That's the only thing that you have to live for. And that child being fucking Joffrey. Yeah, and then that child comes out and it's Joffrey. And it's interesting, too, she talks about how all the bad kids were always bad babies, but that Joffrey was a great baby, that he was always smiling, he never cried, he was so happy when they were together. You could tell that maybe if Joffrey had grown up to be more like Tommen, or more kind-hearted, a bit smarter, then maybe Cersei would have transformed in her later years as well, that she would have became a more compassionate character if she had a more compassionate son to raise. That kind of just furthers the way that she is already going with Robert, where she's just going to become this bitter spiteful human being i attribute the way cersei is more to tywin than robert because i think and the way Ty- tywin viewed jamie as opposed to her i kind of always gave her that edge that she needs to go she needs to go over the top to sh- prove that she i blame it on robert it's uh, probably a mix of both because he did she did love him i think if robert was a good husband then i think she would have been a solid wife yeah it's kind of and then when he climbed on her at that. their wedding night stinky of wine she loved rhaegar she wasn't a big robert fan. Yeah, she liked robert she had all the Rhaegar posters in her room, had but all of his dad, albums. I want to marry Rhaegar. He's dead. Got all of his merch. Got his merch. His, yeah. uh, his harp. Ra- Rhaegar being a vlogger. <laughs> What's up, YouTubers? I'm here with my harp solo that I wrote for you, Cersei Lannister. Psych. Lyanna. Love Psych, you, babe. Lyanna. <laughs> Aren't you married? Chill, chill, chill. Well, whatever it was that made her this way, I'm glad it happened because she is great. <laughs> And they go into this more with Tyrion in Season 5 when they're at the fighting pits where Tyrion talks about how he never enjoyed violence. He doesn't enjoy it when it's for war or for entertainment. And he has this line here with Cersei when he asks her, when does it end? When does the fighting stop? When do the wars stop? And Cersei has a line that every time we... No, Tyrion says that. That every time we make kill an enemy, then two more take their place. And Cersei's like, well, it looks like it's going to be going on for a mighty long time. <laughs> it's cool to get that insight into Tyrion that he just doesn't enjoy this. He'd much rather just be sitting in a winery somewhere, getting drunk. And another great foreshadowing, too, of what Arya is going to become in later seasons when they come across the Frey camp. And they're all talking about, they're bragging, one of them says that he was the one who sewed Grey Wind's head onto Rob's body. And they're all kind of just celebrating their victory. And Arya just can't stand it. And it's, it's amazing to me that this little girl 
had the balls to get off the horse, take the hound's knife, and be willing to kill these grown men. When we first, her first kill was out of necessity. This right. is the first time we really see her kill out of vengeance or spite. It's or premeditated. She, she wants to. Yeah. It's kind of, like you said last time, we always forget that she's just a young girl. Everything that's gone through with her family and with her and seeing that image of Rob and his wolf's head on top of his, it must, she must just be going insane right now. She needs something to release her anger. When you come across p- people mocking, like we said before, how they're just disrespecting and mocking Rob Stark, her brother, and her family. It's just too much for her. Yeah, and it's it's a moment where you kind of start to see Arya differently. They definitely deserve to die. We keep saying it, she's just a little girl, so it's weird seeing her kill him in this way, where the way that she's kind of wailing and do they, though? keeps stabbing and stabbing and stabbing. Yeah, I think they do. I think it's they're an enemy of her family, and it is war. I mean, you can obviously get into it. Well, yeah, for them, too, it's still war. Right, like, right. Like, they didn't give the order. But what I was going to make the comparison might be to... Pe- they might be pieces of shit, but... In the books, in Bravos, when she kills the deserter from the Night's Watch, the singer, to me, that made me see Arya differently in the book, where I said, wow, this is... She's really taking the law into her own hands. I don't know if this guy deserved to die by Arya's hand. I don't know if that's her business. But that's why I think it's different in the show, because after what you just saw... Knowing that these men are part of the army that betrayed your family, part of that family, I think they do deserve it. And I don't see Arya that much differently. It obviously is shocking to see a little girl do this. I guess in a medieval society, it's not that egregious. Right. Like well, the hound, too. He's like, next time you do this. Yeah, tell me. <laughs> I love his reaction. They're, they're such a great pair, too, man. When they fight together, it's always so cool. Well, the only reason why she had the balls to do that because she knew when the other three ran up, the, <laughs> the safety blanket, <laughs> the yeah. hound was going to be there, ready it's to like scrap. Got LeBron on my team. And he just sits down, eats their rabbit, whatever they were cooking. <laughs> and uh, the way that he takes the knife from her too, he's give me that, you little rascal. From you. Is that the first man you've killed? The first man. Next time you're going to do something like that, tell me first. Um, and she looks at the coin, and you hear the the ominous music of the faceless men, and you just know that that's what she's thinking, that I need to find my way to Bravos. And But Maisie Williams, too, is just such an incredible young actress, the way that she pr- plays the innocent girl where, I'm hungry, I'm cold. I've just seen you stab a man 40 times. <laughs> <laughs> and in the last episode, we saw John escape from the wildlings and here he's kind of watering his horse watering himself you know he's haven't taken a bath in so long guards are gonna get infected those cuts yeah. yeah and what does he hear he hears the bow and arrow and egret tracked him down yeah and he just starts talking like he didn't have a choice and that she he says that she always knew who he was and you could just see how rose yeah. leslie not a word spoken in the scene but it's every movement with the bow it's every facial and, that, and grimace and mannerism the best is when he says when he says i love you you love me and she goes yeah she kind of cocks it a little more but <laughs> she's still like dying inside right. everyone's dying inside i know i love you i know you love me he challenges her says i know that you won't kill me she's like yeah i won't kill you but i'm gonna shoot you in places that are gonna hurt because we know Egret is such a great shot that she obviously let him go. That final look on her face, the way that she's trembling and her jaw is just shaking, its you could just see the pain, and it's such a good performance by this actress, Rose Leslie. She's yeah. so good. See, Rob, it's not that hard to take a couple arrows. Well, you're Team Rob. Look at John. Yeah, that's John takes arrows better than Rob. Facts. And when he dies, he comes back. Double fact. This is such a nice little scene, too, where Sam arrives at Castle Black with Gilly, and they're talking to Maester Eamon. And Maester Raymond really was the safety blanket for Sam and John in these earlier seasons because he's kind of the Obi-Wan character of Game of Thrones. I always said that they didn't have a, a wise old man character because it could have been Pycelle, but he's kind of just a dick. But Maester Raymond is truly a good-hearted person. He's one of the few that you see in the show. Yeah, and it inspires Gilly in the, sh- in the books to name her baby Aemon instead of Sam. Right. That would have been interesting. But it is nice when Sam learns that the baby's named after him. It's a sweet moment. It's like, oh. But Eamon's like, did you forget your vows, young boy? It's like, uh, do you forget how conception works? We've been gone for like six months, bro. That is, that's a good point. But it is, it's cool to see Maester Eamon. He's such a prominent person in the Night's Watch that he is so understanding of this wildling woman. Where if it was like Alistair Thorne, he would have like gutted her (laughs) and served the baby for dinner. Well, no, the baby could have been a good man on the man on the wall. So <laughs> you're gonna guard the artillery. <laughs> we need all the men that we can get. 
Yeah. That uh, would have been so fucking funny to see that baby in the Night's Watch cloak. <laughs> just, just walking on the wall. Got a mustache all of a sudden. He becomes very hardened after yeah. being part of the Night's Watch. Yeah, but Sam tells him that he saw the White Walkers, and it speaks to the relationship these characters have and how Eamon views Sam, because he believes him right away. So much so, he acts right away. How many? We have 44 ravens, get him fed, and he sends out the note to every lord in Westeros. And this is, too, where, it's, where we're getting to what the show is really about, who's the true enemy. And it's this scene, and it's a later scene between Davos, Stannis, and Melisandre. These motherfuckers are coming. The White Walkers are coming for everybody. Characters are, are starting to slowly understand the true threat. And I always love these scenes, too, because it's, it gets me so excited for season eight that it's finally here. Speaking of Davos, he's reading the letters with Shireen in the room. And yeah. He's struggling a little. <laughs> he Until he gets that one letter from Eamon. Yeah, like, he does. Oh, shit, I can read this one he quickly. Doesn't, he doesn't understand silent Gs. No, he doesn't. That little Wayne boy would have blew his Nigget. mind. Real G's moving silence like lasagna. Yeah. yeah. Davos Should've... would have been like the Twin Peaks nuclear <laughs> explosion. <laughs> what? It is a nice little comedic moment, too, where he gets the um, letter from Stannis's niece that it's her birthday. <laughs> We'd be very honored if Stannis would come to the name day. Yeah, he's not going there. He's... We'll send a gift. Cash. Send him a hoop and stick. A hoop and stick. Those <laughs> kids love the hoop and stick. <laughs> It's a hoop and a stick. Like you said, he receives the letter from Maester Eamon, and he immediately stops what he's doing, because I guess he realizes this could be something bigger than what they're fighting for now. It's a nice touch, too, with the bells, but the bells are really for Rob Stark. It's very honorable, Stannis. Yeah. He was a king, so we'll ring the bells. <laughs> it's like, he is a knight, after all. It's Sir Jamie. He is a knight, whatever so. he is. And her brother, Jamie Lannister, the Kingslayer, by right of birth and blood. I do this day lay claim. Make it Sir Jamie Lannister, the King's Slayer. Whatever else he is, the man's still a knight. That's a great scene. Let's go back and do that scene. Episode 1 of Season 2, Game of Thrones. Comp- compilations when Stannis was just... Somebody was like, I can't wait for the revisited, revisited. Hell yeah. Where you guys go back and revisit the revisited. But well, yeah. after Season 8, we're going to have a new perspective on these episodes, so we have to go, go back, back and right? revisit the revisited. This is a great back and forth, too, between Stannis... And Davos, and it's one of it's the one scene where I think Stannis wins the argument because Davos is saying about how you can't use blood magic to unite a kingdom. Stannis is like, "Do you know whose room we're sitting in right now?" Yeah, he's doing the classic. What was his name? What did he do? Did what he have, did he have? dragons? What do they breathe? Fire. It's so great too. The imagery of Stannis standing in the middle with Melisandre on one side and Davos like the angel and devil. Yeah, it's such a great shot. And that's the line, what is one bastard boy to an entire kingdom? Another great line, too, is that when Davos says, I've seen things crawl out of nightmares with my eyes open. The world has got so far bent, I've seen things crawl out of nightmares, but my eyes were open. Some poetry right there. Let's see Davos. Guy learns to read, he thinks he's fucking Langston Hughes. <laughs> I think he has a feature on Yandi. Yeah, he does. Yeah. But this is the decision where Melisandre is saying we need to kill Gendry to get these other kings. We had a little touch of it with the leeches, but imagine we get all the blood. And Davos makes the decision to go and free he Gendry. He turns into fucking Superman. <laughs> yeah. Faith in Gendry's blood. Gendry says, what is this, a trick? And Davos is like, yeah, but it's not on you. He has a great moral core where he can tell the difference between right and wrong. You know, he also doesn't believe in this blood magic bullshit. <laughs> It's one thing to have a dragon. It's another thing to, like, pull blood out of somebody with a leech. It's not as majestic. I think he believes it. I just don't think he trusts it because he's seen what it could do. And he frees Gendry, tells him to go to King's Landing. Don't drink the seawater. And it's great, too, when they reunited Season 7. He's like, oh, I thought you were still rowing. He was gone for a long time, but he comes back. Gendry's going to King's Landing, and John is returning to Castle Black. It's a lot of uh, homecomings. Yeah, homecomings. It's John, and then I think the scene after that is Jamie. Yeah. And Danny arrives at her new home. But with John, it's nice to see him back with Pip and Sam. They've been away from each other for so long. And it really sets up John's arc moving forward over the next couple of seasons that he's going to take that prominent leadership role with Gior Mormont now dead, that he's going to become almost the de facto leader of Castle Black, even before he becomes Lord Commander, because he's making so many of the decisions. Yeah, you could tell the room is kind of split, but he does inspire people to want to follow him, and he is a great leader. I mean, he's not overly in your face about it, but just by his actions, he's someone that you can get behind. Yeah, he's kind of like the Kobe Bryant leader. He's not the rah-rah, he's just lead by example. I'm the best player on the team, do what I say. Um, yeah. But, but James, I- give Kobe some love. How much love do we give LeBron? 
Well, LeBron's a goat. LeBron sees a crowd. He turns the corner and just bullets in a powerful. Jamie arriving back in King's Landing. It's another great homecoming where he's looking at all the people in Flea Bottom just kind of doing their jobs. And somebody pushes them out of the way and says, hey, we're working here, eh? King he's, Slayer. He's a disgusting one. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> in he that really scenario. is. And Brienne gives him that look where it's, I'm happy for you. I'm happy that you can be back with your loved ones. And it's such a great scene in the next season when Cersei and Jamie have this conversation where Cersei's kind of just blaming him for being caught. Like, you should have been quicker. You should have got here sooner. Jamie's like, I don't have a hand. Not really a word said, but you can tell. Just the relief on and Cersei and Jamie. And really? Just... The relief? <laughs> Oh. Relief turns to angst very quickly because <laughs> she notices the no hand. She's like, oh, brother. I know, but, well, they're finally reunited. and What a reunion it what is. A, it's a pet, they're a power couple. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay, if you want to call them that. <laughs> One of the funniest lines of the whole series to me is when Stannis learns what Davos did and he sentences him to death. <laughs> Davos is like, I, Stannis. Of the House Baratheon, first in my name, rightful King of the Andals, and the first men sentence you to die. I understand. But since you haven't yet unnamed me Hand of the King, it is my duty to advise you against it. You're gonna need me. Take him away. I advise strongly against you killing me. Spot the lie. Just uh, before we get into what they're discussing in the scene, how great is the lighting? With yeah. the sun coming into great. the room. I oh, that too. The battle between ice and fire that is, at this point, Stannis feels that he is fire, that he is going to be Azor High. And it just continues to speak to Stannis' desperation that he's willing to go to any length in order to win the Iron Throne. And like I said previously, Davos has been trying to tell him, this is blood magic. This is not dragons and a legendary name like Targaryen. You're killing people that are related to you. You're not inspiring anybody to follow you with this Red Witch. This is a religion that's foreign to the people of Westeros. This isn't going to work. And when we see some of the decisions that Stannis makes later... In the later seasons, we know that he's been truly lost, but this is his just gradual descent into this delusion. There has got to be another way. What other way? Tell us about this other way. I don't know you, Grace. I can't see the future in the fire. Which is now resulting in him thinking that he's Azor Ahai reborn, this legendary hero. Yeah, and that's kind of a uh, friend later when Davos is being dragged out by the guards. He pulls the letter out and it tells him what's happening uh, beyond the wall. And Melisandre sees in the flames that, yeah, this is the real fight. The real fight is north and that he is that Azor Ahai character and his place is there. Yes. And she says, the War of the Five Kings, it's pointless. This is the true war. And she's the one that says, hey, we need, we're going to need Davos. <laughs> <laughs> and Stannis again smiles at like very morbid He laughs, stuff. yeah, like, yeah. It's like, you see? <laughs> Red God, you hate so much, it saves your life. And that look that Melisandre gives to Davos, those eyes, she just never blinks. That line, too, that Stannis says, you're in his army now. They should have just went at it one time. Fight? No. Melisandre and Davos, just one. You think so? Just to get out all the bad blood? Yeah, get the tension out, and then I think things would have went a little more smoothly. If they would have had a nice hate fuck, I think this <laughs> yeah. would have been a lot more successful for Stannis. Like, you know what? That Red God... Not too bad. Not? <laughs> Comes out smoking a cigarette, got his <laughs> robe on. Listen, Stannis, I'm telling you, this Rolar guy. But like I said previously, the way that they're setting up the true threat, I've always, I always loved these scenes in the earlier seasons because it just made me think about how epic the war is going to be, the Great War. And the final scene of the season is when Daenerys has finally conquered Yunkai and she's waiting for the slaves to come out. It's another great final Daenerys scene. Yeah, the doors open and the, uh, the former slaves come out to greet Daenerys. It seems a little standoffish at first. You know, and Solo get their spears ready. You can see Dario in the back gripping his sword. Like, they don't know what's going to happen, but they embrace her. Call her Misha, mother, for liberating them. And she, and she even says before that uh, before they come out, like, how are they going to feel being conquered? And Jorah says, you didn't conquer them, you freed them. Right, yeah. She doesn't know if she's a conqueror or a liberator yeah. at this point. And this speech that Missandei gives to them where she says that you can thank Daenerys for your freedom, and Daenerys kind of stops her. It says, nobody can give you your freedom, you have to take it. But they can still appreciate what Daenerys did to it, did for them. Because you need somebody in that position of power. And there have been some, there's been some controversy surrounding this scene. It kind of makes her out to be a white savior. But my argument to that would be there's a lot of people in Westeros where they're all white that need a lot of liberation as well. So, I mean, she's in a place with these individuals who are going to be slaves are being ruled by people that look like them. Kind of this feudal system 
where some people have been designated as slaves. So that's why I kind of push back on the white savior criticism. There's people of need of liberation in Westeros just as bad as these people. I think it's a little much, though, when they're like... She's, Carrying her off. She's crowd surfing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, and just people have a, said that it's a bad visual. Yeah, just from a visual stand. No, just like that and just... Oh, it's a little cheesy for Game of Thrones. Like them crowd surfing and her spreading out. Like, we get it. Daenerys, you're... We all love you, and you're a liberator, and we can't wait for you to go to Westeros. Well, I think the music, the combination of the music, Daenerys actually enjoying a moment where, how many times do we really see her smile like this? Where I think it's it's probably the widest smile that Amelia Clark has ever done on the show. Where you look at season seven, I don't think she barely enjoys anything anymore. So it's nice. It's We say that she's the MVP of this season. MVP of season three. I think I said, yeah, looking back at the whole scope of the season, not to have a recency bias, I kind of want to say Tywin. Right, but right. From where Daenerys was and her ability to get the Unsullied and just conquer two cities, I think it has to be Daenerys. Right. I think at this point she's on a right track. And I guess it's in later seasons that she's not enjoying it as much because the road gets a lot harder from here. Because Marine is an absolute challenge. It's not as. Yunkai was a couple of nights. It's we send in Jorah, Dario, and Grey Worm, and we got the city already. You know, last time we see the true Dario. So. But it caps off this final scene. I think I think it's just a great cap for this season, where they always do such a great job of that final scene. And it's kind of similar to her sailing to Westeros. You got the dragons in the air, and it's great. It's a great season overall. Yeah, one of the best, if not the best. But season four is arguably just as good, if not better. So well, they complement each other so well. Yeah, because it's the one book. It's mm-hmm. the Storm of Swords book. And that's why I appreciate the show so much that they took the books and they split them up. Like Feast for Crows was a couple of seasons. Oh, wait, no, no. Well, they did it good this time. Okay, we'll give them that. Right. <laughs> yeah, great season. Can't wait to revisit season four. And to everyone we've lost in season three, 